Okay, ionic compounds. There are lots and lots of ionic compounds. They're very prevalent. So if you were to look at the Earth's crust, at the rock and the dirts, dirt and stuff, most of those substances in there are ionic compounds. They're very stable because ionic bonds are very strong. Here's some examples. Um, here we have Morton's light salt. What makes it light? Does it have fewer calories? Well, salt doesn't have calories to start with. Um, it's, it's lighter in sodium, and that's because it's a mixture of regular table salt, sodium chloride, and potassium chloride. And so it's better for you know, blood pressure issues and people who are sodium sensitive. Um, Tums contain calcium carbonate, an ionic compound that's good at reducing stomach acid. Here we have a couple of examples of minerals, calcite and trona. Trona is the crystalline form of this crazy thing. Right? So there's a lot of different ionic compounds out there. So we are going to learn how to write formulas for ionic compounds. This should be review, but it may have been iffy in your previous class, right? It might not have sunk in. So I'll start at the beginning. So writing formulas for ionic compounds. We start out by looking at the formula for the metal cation with its charge and the formula for the anion with its charge. And then we're going to look at the charges to identify how many atom, how many ions of each do I need so that when I put them together, their charges add up to zero because ionic compounds are neutral. They don't have an overall positive or negative charge. So we figure out how to do that with the subscripts and then we double check and make sure that the charges are adding up the charges of the cations equal the charges of the anions. So that's very simple sounding. Um, just summarizing, ionic compounds are always positive and negative ions. The first element is usually a metal. Here is the one exception that you need to know. Some ionic compounds contain the cation ammonium, NH4+. So if you see an element, I'm sorry, a compound formula that starts with NH4, it's not going to have any metals in it, but it is ionic. Okay. Some of the positive and negative charges has to equal zero, and then the formula of the ionic compound reflects the smallest whole number ratio. So let's look at some examples here. So. We're asked to write the formula for the compound formed between potassium and sulfur. So the first thing we have to do is write the formulas for these ions with their charges. So we need to know the symbol for potassium. Well, the symbol is K, and the charge is plus one. How do we know it's plus one? It's in group, it's in group one. All of the metals in group one make plus one ions. In group two, plus two. In group three, plus three. Isn't that nice? Sulfur. What's the symbol? S. What's the charge? Two minus. So we figure that out by we look at sulfur and its position on the periodic table. Start with argon, the noble gas, that would be zero and count backwards, negative one would be chlorine, negative two is sulfur. Okay, we, we covered these in chapter two. There are a bunch of main group elements where we can predict the charges just from where the element is on the periodic table. Okay, so now that we have these, we have to figure out what combination of these do I need so that when I put them together, they add up to zero. There are several different ways to think about this, and this is an example of the sidewalk issue. Um, so I mentioned this last week, and I just made it up in class on Wednesday, and then when I repeated it on Thursday, it got better. So I'll give you the better version. So a lot of these math problems that we see, and this ends up being a math problem, are like walking on a sidewalk, right? And you walk on the sidewalk all the time. How many times do you ever fall off the sidewalk, right? Like never. But if the sidewalk was a bridge across the Grand Canyon without any guardrails, 
could you just walk across the sidewalk? No, you'd be freaked out, right? Because, oh, I don't want to fall. So that's what happens when you look at a problem like this. If I gave this to you in the form of little boys and cookies and trying to share cookies, or this person has this many dollars and we need to you know, get the bill paid or whatever, you could figure it out, no problem. But when I give you ions, some of you feel like you're in the middle of the Grand Canyon on a sidewalk and you panic, okay? So just know that you can do this, okay? There is no Grand Canyon under there. It's just a picture. It's one of those sidewalk illusion things. It's actually solid concrete the whole way, okay? So we have a positive and, a, and an ion that has two negative charges. If I push these together, their charges are gonna add up to minus one, right? So I need more positives. So one way to do this, which I think gives us a better understanding of what's going on, is to just draw more symbols. So we have the chemical formulas for the ions. We'll just draw some more ion formulas. So if I put another K plus here, and maybe you wanna keep track down here of your total. Now I've got plus two from those guys and minus two from this one. And positive two and negative two add up to zero. So I need two of these and one of those so that the, together they're neutral. And then the formula, the, the metal always goes first. So I have K and there's two of those and sulfur. And I don't write the one because I'm a chemist and I have a philosophical opposition to writing the number one. Another way to do this, which is very popular students with students, and works most of the time, but can get you into trouble. So you still have to do the formulas of the ions with their charges. And then you look at the numbers and you see that they're not the same number. Then you can do crisscross. So what the crisscross does is it takes the number here, there's an unwritten one, that becomes an unwritten one over here and it takes the two and brings it down here. So you have K2S. That works most of the time, but it doesn't always give you the lowest ratio, and so you need to double check that. And then some of you will look at this and you can just tell. Some of you realize this is a least common multiple problem. Um, we can also draw a picture of like a balance beam, a teeter-totter, and we can have boxes of bowling balls and figure it out that way. So if you struggle with this, please ask me in lab, and I've got like a whole bunch of other ways I can explain it to you. So that's the formula for the compound form between potassium and sulfur. The metal always goes first. Why? Just because. Convention. Okay, I think of metals as being masculine and the non-metals as being non-masculine, right, or feminine. And so if you think about formal invitations, is it Mr. and Mrs. or Mrs. and Mr.? It's Mr. and Mrs. Why? Because men are superior and they're dominating women. No, it's just convention, right? It's just convention. The man's name comes first. It has no reflection on value or anything like that. You just get over it, right? So the metal goes first, and then the non-metal, just like invitations. Let's look at aluminum and nitrogen. So first, we need the formulas for the ions. So aluminum has a symbol, AL. And I write that as script L, so it doesn't look like AI. Call him Al. Um, what's, what's the charge on Al? Three plus because aluminum is in group three. And nitrogen is N, and what's the charge on nitrogen? Three minus. Because we look at the periodic table and we count backwards from the noble gases, <coughs> or group number minus eight. <coughs> so this one should be easy, and we definitely don't want to overthink this. Look at the numbers. Three and three, they're the same. All we have to do is nudge these guys together. So we put one aluminum with one nitrogen, done. 
I don't want to do crisscross and get AL3M3. Three three. Any questions? That's a good question. Why did I add another one here? Because if I put these two together, just one of each, if I, if I wrote KS, it would together have a negative one charge. And I'm writing a compound formula. Compounds are always neutral. The way we figure out how many of each ion there are is by looking at the charges and understanding that it has to be a neutral compound. Does that help? So this, this wouldn't work. Yes? So where we're doing an ion compound, we always have to have the neutral, just because the compound Yeah, so the, with the compound, it has to be neutral. Yep. The charges of the anions and the charges of the cations have to add up to zero. Anybody else? So say it was a, instead of sulfur, it was like phosphorus? Mm-hmm. Um, did you put three gates? Yep. So if we had potassium, with phosphorus, then I would need three potassiums so that the charges add up to zero. So that would be K3P. Or you could crisscross charges. Yeah. Good questions. Like I said, this is like walking on a sidewalk. It's just that you think there's the Grand Canyon underneath, and so you freak out. Okay, that's writing formulas. What about naming? Um, there are some compounds that have common names, but everything also has a systematic name. So we are going to learn the systematic name, and there are different systems for different types of compounds, just like for people, and cultures, we have different ways of naming our children, right? So my ancestors came from Sweden. I don't do this anymore, but back in the day, um, the son would take as his last name, his father's first name with the word son after it. So if your dad's name was John, then your last name is Johnson because you're the son of John, right? And if your dad's name was Hans, then you'd be Hansen or Peterson. That's how all those Scandinavian names ended up with son at the end. My maiden name was Johnson. Um, but for the girls, um, you would take your dad's first name and put daughter, D-O-T-T-E-R. And so if your dad's name was John, then your last name is John's daughter. Or you could be Peter's daughter. And, and then, so, you know, let's say uh, John has a son and his name is Anders. So he's Anders Johnson, and then he has a son named Peter, and his kid is Peter Anderson. So the, the last name changed every generation? Yeesh. So they, they quit doing that. But that was how they named. And in Asian countries to this day, there are different patterns of naming children, right? Some cultures, there are very few family names Right? And sometimes the family name is first, and some only use one name. There's different patterns. And so to understand how to name, you just have to know what country does this person come from. So we need to know what group, what kind of compound is this so that we can apply the, the correct naming system. So again, we have to identify, and the way we identify ionic, ionic compounds is they're generally composed of metals and nonmetals. The one exception is if it starts with NH4, the one you need to remember. Um, books always talk about how there's two types of ionic compounds. I kind of think this is dumb, but there it is. Um, it has to do with, does the metal only form one kind of ion? Is it one of the predictable ones? Or can it form more than one ion? So these are the predictable ones. So we've got the metals in group one and group two and group three. Um, and then there's two more that I want you to learn, and that is zinc and silver. Scandium also only forms one ion, but we don't run into that one very much, and so I don't care if you remember it or not. I 
think I have an animation here. Nope, I don't. Okay. So, um, there are other elements. Anything that's not one of those can form more than one element. I guess I should back up here. The name of the ions is just the same as the element name. So, aluminum, the ion Al3 plus is just aluminum ion. And Na plus is sodium ion. Because there's only one kind and we know what the charge is. All the other metals can form more than one kind of ion. And so then their name has to tell us which ion they are. And so this is a little bit like, you know, King Henry of, of England, right? Well, which King Henry? Because there was a bunch of them, right? How do you differentiate the King Henrys with Roman numerals, right? So is this, you know, Henry the Seventh or Henry the Eighth? So here we've got the same idea with these metals. So iron, there are two different common forms of the iron ion, plus two and plus three. And so this is called iron two, and this is called iron three. Roman numerals after the name in parentheses. And if you care about details, there's not a space between the element name and the parentheses. Word might yell at you about that, but this is right. So why don't we use Roman numerals all the time? Because it's kind of a pain, right? My, my husband doesn't go around writing his name as Kirk Kawagoa the first. Well, of course he's the first. He's the only one. We don't need to point that out. We only start pointing things out like that if there's another one, right? If we had named one of our sons Kirk Kawagoa, then he'd be probably Kirk Kawagoa Jr. Um, after you get from senior and junior, then you'll go into the Roman numerals, right? So John Smith the fourth, right? But you don't use the Roman numeral if you don't need to, right? Most of us, I don't think any of you have Roman numerals after your name. This is extra, right? We don't want to write extra stuff. So if it's one of these elements, the highlighted ones there, we don't use a Roman numeral because it isn't needed. There's only one kind. There's only one guy with that name. If it's anybody else, then we use the Roman numerals. Now, the nice thing is, you don't need to know that there are two common ions of iron and that they are plus two and plus three. You don't need to know if there are more. We have the, the name if we are looking at the name of a compound and it, we can figure out which one it is based on the relative charges if we're given a formula. So we just have to be able to identify it. So this is the systematic naming. Um, these are older names. And I want you to know that those exist because they still show up different places. I remember as a kid growing up, the toothpaste commercials were always claiming, you know, this one was better because it contained stannous fluoride. Well, that's this guy right down here, stannous fluoride. It had tin 2 fluoride in it, but tin doesn't sound like something you'd want to be sticking in your mouth, right? You ever chew on tin foil or aluminum foil? And ugh. Um, so they use the other name for it. Sounds better. So these are out there. I am not going to require you to know those. They could show up on like a worksheet or on a homework um, something like that where you can go look it up they will not be on exams okay so these are the ones we need to know um, quick review of Roman numerals so um, for one it's a capital I and for two is two capital I's and three is three capital I's you're like, okay, well, this is just going to end up being tally marks, right? Um, we'll skip four for a minute. Five is capital V. I don't know why, it just is. Four is the number before five, right? So it's an I, it's one before five. 
So that's four. And six is one after five. So there's five, and here's one after five. It's kind of cool. Can you imagine doing multiplication this way? Seven. It's two after. And then it just it keeps going like that, and then 10 is X, and then I don't remember the ones after that, but there's M and D and C, and they stand for things like 100 and 1,000, and it's just it's really kind of crazy. So here are my tricks. So group 1A and 2A form ions where the charge equals the group number. And then we have this triangle. So get the pointer out. Um, here's the triangle. Here's group 3A. There's aluminum. And gallium and indium are also in there, and they're going to form 3 plus ions. We don't see them very much, but they're there. And then zinc and cadmium form plus 2, and silver forms plus 1. And so there's a triangle here. The um, group 3 are plus 3. And then I think of this as, you know, going down the stairs. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. So, right? Here's, this is the third step and the second step and the first step. So, three, two, one. If it's not one of these guys, group 1A, 2A, or in this triangle, it needs a Roman numeral. So groups 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc, and silver. Those are the ones we really need to remember. And I will chant this enough times that you're just going to remember it in spite of yourself. Group 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc, and silver. No Roman numeral because they only form one charge and we know what it is based on the periodic table. Any other one, put a Roman numeral on it. Now these guys in here, we're just not going to run into them. So those are the cations. What about the anions? Well, there are monatomic and polyatomic anions. Monatomic means there's one atom. These are just the simple ones. So we look at the non-metal elements like fluorine, and this forms an F minus charge. We predict the charge based on the location in the periodic table. The name of this, we take the ending of the element name and change it to ide. So fluorine becomes fluoride. Chlorine becomes chloride. And this works in my chemistry land along with the masculine, feminine idea. So traditionally, a man and a woman get married. Who changes their last name? The woman does. So here, this is very, very traditional. Think like 1950s, right? So I think of fluorine as being the woman in this situation. So the woman, when she gets together with the man and they get married, she changes the ending of her name. The guy doesn't, right? So you put sodium and fluorine together and they become sodium fluoride. The metal first, the nonmetal second, and the nonmetal changes the ending of her name. Because we don't want it to look like it's just a list of elements, sodium fluorine. It's sodium fluoride. It's a compound. They're united together. So these charges are predictable. Group number minus one or count backward from the noble gases. Any questions? So <clears throat> naming binary ionic compound. Binary means two. So these compounds have two ions. One cation, one anion. And so we just take the name of the cation, and then there's a little space, and the name of the anion. So these have two different elements, um, and we've just covered how we name those ions. So for KCl, um, we have two elements here, potassium and chlorine. Potassium comes first, and for metals we should always wonder, do I need a Roman numeral? And the way you identify that is you ask yourself, well, is it in groups 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc, or silver? It's in group 1A, no Roman numeral. So the name of that is just potassium. And then the second one is chlorine. And chlorine changes the ending of her name 
to chloride, potassium chloride. For CaO, the first element is a metal, so we know this is an ionic compound. And we ask ourselves, well, is calcium in groups 1A, 2A, 3A zinc or silver? Yeah, it's in group 2A. So I don't need a Roman numeral, because I know its charge is plus 2, because it's in group 2. So that's calcium. And then oxygen, we change the ending of the name to oxide. And, you know, if you wrote oxygide, because, well, I thought I was just supposed to get rid of the EN. I might giggle, but I wouldn't count it wrong. And most of these things on an exam will be multiple choice, and I won't try to trick you with something like that. So let's do a couple of examples here. So name this compound, AG3N. Well, first of all, is it, is it an ionic compound? Yeah, because silver is a metal. So I already gave that away. The element that has the formula AG, or the symbol AG, is silver. So we start with silver, and then we ask ourselves, does it need a Roman numeral? Is it in groups 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc, or silver? Yeah, it's silver. No Roman numeral. OK, done with that. The other element is nitrogen. What do I change its name to? Nitride. So this is silver nitride. Spelling is somewhat important here. Because if I write a T instead of a D, that's a very, very different compound. And um, just one letter switched like that could kill somebody, right? So we, we do have to be careful here. Yes? So we don't worry about the Exactly. We do not worry about this. So the temptation is to say, this is trisilver nitrite. That sounds real fancy, right? But we don't need that. So this nomenclature, a lot of students are just like, hate it, right? It's actually been thought out to be very concise and just as simple as we possibly can make it. I mean, if you think this is bad and you want to come up with a better system, I'd be happy to hear about it. Um, I don't think you can find it. If we look at these ions, what's the charge on a silver ion? Plus one. Because if you look on the periodic table, aluminum is plus three because it's in group three. And then you go down the steps. Aluminum's plus three, zinc's plus two, silver's plus one. And what's the charge on nitrogen three. as an ion? Three minus. I predict the charges from their position on the periodic table. And so if I have this name, silver nitride, I know that these are the formulas, and I can predict what this formula is. That's why I don't need to specify the number three anywhere in the name. Okay? So here's um, a name, and we're supposed to write the formula. Rubidium sulfide. Well, what element? What's the symbol for rubidium? RB. RB. So find it on the periodic table. What's the charge on it? Plus, plus, one. plus one, because it's in group one. Sulfide comes from sulfur and the charge is two. 2 minus and then I have to figure out what combination of those two what, I'm looking for the smallest combination that will give me a neutral compound I need two rubidiums to one sulfur so this is going to be RB 2 S any questions? Well, what if it's one of the other metals? Well, you just put its Roman numeral, indicate which Henry it is in, in between there, and you go on the same as always. If we've got, um, when we're looking at these, how do we know what the charge is? How do we know what Roman numeral to put in there? We figure that out. We infer it from the charge on the anion and the relative numbers of those ions. So let's look at this one, CRBR3. 
I'm supposed to name this. Well, is the first one a metal? Yes, it is. And what is its name? Chromium. Is chromium in groups 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc, or silver? No. It needs a Roman numeral. I might not know off the top of my head what that Roman numeral is. I'm just going to put the parentheses here and save a space for it. I'll figure that out later. And then bromine, bromide. I leave a space, bromide. These are names, but they're not proper nouns. They're not capitalized unless it starts a sentence and then only the first one will be. So how do I know what the Roman numeral is? I have to look at the charges. So I've got CR, I don't know what the charge is. And what's the charge on bromine? One minus. There's three of those. And so some of you can say, oh, it's gotta be plus three. But some of you are afraid of the Grand Canyon and uh, understandably so. There are three of those, right? BR3. And so I just wrote it three times with its charge. So the total negative charge there is what? Negative three. If this compound is gonna be neutral, the total positive charge has to be positive three. There's only one chromium because it just says CR doesn't say CR2. There's only one of those, and so it has to be plus three. And so that's how I figure out that this has a Roman numeral three. Any questions? Yes? We, I think we'll have an example where there's two subscripts. Yes? Um, so are they always, the, the transition elements, we don't have, like, an, um, an automatic knowledge of what their, um, what their charge is. Right. That's correct. The transition elements, we don't know just off the top of our heads or by any clues on the periodic table what the charges are. But we'll know. The main group elements, yes. Okay. So, like, yeah, group 1A, always plus 1. Group 2A, always plus 2. Group 3A, always plus 3, except for the guy at the bottom, but we're not going to run into him, so we ignore him. We would never put two metals together in an ionic compound in Chem 1A. Yeah. Now, Chem 1B, different, different story. But here, our ionic compounds are always going to have one kind of metal and then an anion. Yes. So if we already have one chromium, we don't count that one? Because wouldn't it be two more? Well, we figured out that the charge on this is three plus because we look at the formula and the formula tells us there's only one. So there's only one chromium and there's three bromines. So let's just back this up. Whoops. Maybe not just erase instead. So going back to not knowing what the charge is. I write the charges for the anion where I know the charges and I know there's three of them. Right? And so I know from the anions there's a total of minus three. And so it's a neutral compound. The total must be positive three for all of the cations. I don't know the charge of the chromium. That's what we're working backwards here. Yeah. Any other questions? So let's name FES. We should call him Dave. No. He has one correct name. So right now we're just doing ionic compounds, but pretty soon we'll just have all kinds of different things, and the first step is identifying what kind of compound. So always look at the first element. Is it a metal? Yes, this is an ionic compound. Okay, so what is the name of the element whose symbol is Fe? Iron. And it's, it's spelled iron, not I-O-R-N. You'd be amazing. You'd be amazed at how many times I see that. 
And at first I'm like, what the heck? Well, iron, I guess. Yeah. Okay, it's iron. Iron. Is that in group 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc, or silver? No. It needs a Roman numeral. So, parentheses. And then S, we would name it sulfur. We call it sulfide. So this is iron something sulfide. Well, this one is a little easier because there's only one of each ion. And we know the charge on the sulfide is 2 minus. There's one of each. I know there are one of each from the formula. So what's the charge on the iron? 2 plus. So that's how I know to put a 2 in here. This 2 does not directly come from any subscript in there. It's related to that, but only through charges, and there's just, this is how we do it. Any questions about that one? Write the formula for ruthenium IV oxide. Well, what's the symbol for ruthenium? Are you? Are you sure? Yeah, yes. What's the charge on it? Four. Four plus. How do we know that? The Roman numeral tells me. Isn't that convenient? Oxide. Oxygen. What's the charge? Two. Two minus. Position on the periodic table. If you're like, wait, how are you getting that? Ask me in lab today. Let's get this straightened out. It's really not hard. You just have to figure it out the one time and you'll be good. Okay, how do we put these two together? They have to add up to zero. The charges have to add up to zero. I need two oxygens. So one ruthenium and two oxygens. So I have to do that. Well, I can draw the symbols, Ru4 plus and O2 minus. And if I look at the total here, I'm like, that doesn't add up to zero. I don't have enough negatives. So I can make another one of those, and then I have minus four, and I'm good. Um, this is one where if you do the crisscross thing, you could get into trouble. If you crisscross, you'll end up with Ru2, O4. And then you have to look at that and say, ah, oh, but that's not the lowest ratio. I need to simplify that. It's Ru2. Questions? Will there ever be the ionic compound that doesn't add up to zero, or does that only happen? Will there ever be an ionic compound that doesn't have its charges add up to zero? No, then it's not a compound. Now, we can have complex ions with metals and nonmetals that have an overall charge, but that doesn't happen in Chem 1A. That's in Chem 1B. Like I said, we lie to you, um, but only because you really don't want to hear the truth. So we're just telling you part of the truth. Any other questions? OK, what if instead of a monatomic ion, we have a polyatomic ion? Well, naming the compound happens the same way, but we have to have a name for that polyatomic ion. And the names and the formulas of the polyatomic ions just have to be memorized. That's why I gave you a list the first day of class and said, memorize these. Because you really don't need to understand anything about it. You can just flat out memorize it, and that works. Now I'm going to show you some patterns in there that might help. Um, but it really comes down to memorizing. So let's look at this NaNO2. Um, we look at the first element, it's a metal, and so we say this is an ionic compound. There are two ions. So I can't break this into three. I can't have sodium, nitrogen, and oxygen. I can only have two. So the metal is one, and everything else is a single kind of ion. So I look at the sodium, and I'm going to break it between the sodium and the NO2. The NO2 together is an ion. 
So I have Na plus, that's in group 1A, so I don't need a Roman numeral, so that's just sodium. And the rest of it is NO2 minus, and I memorize that, that's nitrite. So this is sodium nitrite. So these guys should look familiar, common polyatomic ions. These guys are all on that list I gave you. There were a few others on there too, but these are the ones that um, you need to know for an exam. Um, so most of these have uh, two elements, um, and most of them are something and oxygen. Then there's some like this one, HCO3 minus. Um, so this is like carbonate CO3, but it's got a hydrogen in front. So hydrogen carbonate. Another name for that is bicarbonate. Um, I don't like that because it's not as descriptive and it's not the official name. It's hydrogen carbonate. And this comes from adding a hydrogen ion to the carbonate ion. And so then it changes the charge and you've got a hydrogen. We see that happen with um, sulfate as well. Here's sulfate, SO4, 2 minus. Hydrogen sulfate, we've added an H plus, and so HSO4 minus. For phosphate, phosphate has a three minus charge, and so you can add one hydrogen or two hydrogens. So adding one hydrogen is hydrogen phosphate, and then if you add two hydrogens, that's dihydrogen phosphate because it has just two hydrogens. The only positive one on here is NH4 ammonium. So most polyatomic ions are oxy anions. They're anions that have oxygen in them. And there are some patterns in these. Um, they form a form series. So you have nitrate and nitrite. And the difference here is the number of oxygens, the, the charge ch stays the same, and the number of the other element stays the same. Sulfate and sulfite, the only difference is the number of oxygens. So eight is the one that has more oxygens and eight has fewer. Okay, fine. Um, so for some of the elements, there's actually a series of four ions. So chlorine and bromine and iodine do this. So here's chlorate. You just, you memorize that one. And perchlorate, per, hyper, means more than. So it's got an extra oxygen. Chlorite is the light version, is one less oxygen. And hypochlorite is below that, it's even one less oxygen. So my tricks, memorize the eights and this pattern. And remember that only the number of oxygens changes. So you memorize this one, and then the per, you add an oxygen. So this is chlorate, you add an oxygen to get perchlorate. This is the light version, like Bud Light has a third fewer calories than regular Budweiser. Chlorite has a third fewer oxygens than regular chlorate. And hypochlorite, hypo means below, like hypodermic needle goes below your skin. Yes? Eight is not always three, yes. Yeah, that's why I say just memorize it. And so somebody was asking about this, and so I pulled this out, and they seem to like it. I haven't used it for years. Um, there, there are various patterns that you can look at on the periodic table, and my husband has one involving a four and a three, and he showed it to me several times, and I can never remember it to tell it to you. So I'm thinking, if I can't remember it, I'm not sure how helpful it actually is. But he swears by it. Um, this is the only pattern I can give you. It's a silly sentence. Nancy cleans cars and soaks potatoes. Right? How's that for silly? That's pretty silly. OK, these are oxyanions. The first three are three. And the next ones are four. And then for the charges, 
minus 1, minus 1, minus 2, minus 2, minus 3. I don't know. If that works for you, Nancy cleans cars and soaks potatoes. I made that up years ago. Now, does that cover all the oxyanions? No. But those are the most important ones. So, if you like this, learn how to write down that list. You get your exam. You turn over the periodic table. Don't look at any of the questions. Because as soon as you look at the questions, what happens to your brain? It just deletes everything, right? Instant memory delete. Now you don't even know what your name is. So before you look at the questions, pull over the periodic table. Write this down. That's not cheating. You brought it in in your head. And then you can go back and look at it. Nitrate, chlorate, carbonate, sulfate, and phosphate. And then from those, you can make per, per chlorate. Now, another thing to know here is chlorine is in the same family as bromine and iodine. They're non-metal, so I think of them as feminine, so they're sisters, right? So a lot of times sisters will have common characteristics. They'll behave in a similar fashion. So iodate and bromate do the same thing with oxygen. So iodate is IO3 minus, and bromate is BrO3 minus. Same charge, same number of oxygens. And then you can form all of these other ones by adding or subtracting oxygens. Okay, so name the compound SnClO3 2. Why are there parentheses there? Because we have more than one polyatomic ion. So looking at this compound, the first element is Sn. If I find that on the periodic table, I can see it's a metal, right? So I've got Sn. And then everything else. So in parentheses, I've got ClO3. What's that look like? Chlorate. What's the charge on chlorate? Negative one. The parentheses are like shrink wrap. And I've got two of these shrink wrapped packages. It's like you go to Costco, you can't buy one bottle of ketchup, right? You can only buy two bottles of ketchup because they're shrink wrapped together. So what we've got here, this is a polyatomic ion, three oxygens and a chlorine, and I have two of those groups. If I didn't have the parentheses, I wrote SnClO3, 2, looks like I might have 32 oxygens, right? That's not what I meant at all. So the way we indicate that no, I have two of those units is we put parentheses around the polyatomic ion. We use parentheses for polyatomic ions, never for the monatomic, because you don't need them for the monatomic. And if we don't need to write parentheses, we don't want to put extra stuff in. And if you only have one polyatomic, you also don't need them, and so you don't write them. So if you put extra parentheses in, I'll scribble them out. But if you leave them out when you need them, then it's wrong. OK, so I've identified the two ions I have. I've got tin something and chlorate. So tin, is tin in group 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc, or silver? No. What does that mean? It needs a Roman numeral. OK, we're saving space. What's the name of this? Chlorate. I don't need to indicate that there's two of them or anything, because I do all of that by looking at the charges. But I do need to figure out what the charge on the tin is. Give me two plus. Because I have two of these guys. Formula tells me I have two chlorates. 
that means the charge on the tin has to be 2 plus in order for the compound to be neutral. Tin 2 chlorate. Any questions? Write the formula for cobalt 2 phosphate. Well, what's the um, ion formula for cobalt 2? CO2 plus. And make sure that's a little O, because we don't want this to be CO2 plus, because that's something entirely different. What's the, char uh, what's the formula for phosphate? PO4. PO4. Three minus. How do I put those two together? Well, we could crisscross, or we could just draw more of them. We could just look at, well, what's my total down here? I've got plus two and minus three. I need more positives. I can't put in half of an atom or an ion. I can only add one. So now I've got plus four. Great. I have a problem in the other direction. Now I need more negatives. So I put the PO4 in again. So if I have two of those, now I've got minus six. Awesome. I'm just going back and forth. This is never going to end. CO2 plus. Oh, phew. It took three of the cobalts and two of the phosphates so they come together and add up to zero. CO2. 3, PO4, 2. So the PO4, because it's polyatomic and I have more than one of them, I'm going to put parentheses and put how many on the outside. Questions? <laughs>